right, well, you probably noticed that um, I reserve myself to the big picture. <laughs> and when it gets down to the details of the nitty gritty, I say, Mary, you can do that. <laughs> uh, we'll reverse that tomorrow. Tomorrow I will be looking at um, John 9 and John 20, as well as the uh, last discourse. And uh, Mary will be looking at the Passion. So um, we've got some enjoyable times ahead of us. Today, for this final session, before we have a little break and then a, uh, a, a, sh a summary of the day, I'm looking at um, a section that I'm calling Celebrating Jewish Feasts. Open your texts, chapter 5. Verse 9. All these numbers are a sign of a misspent youth. When I should have been doing useful things, I was doing all this. Verse 9. You'll notice the second half of verse 9. That day was a Sabbath. Turn over to chapter 6, verse 4. 6 4. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. Turn over to chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. Then this feast goes on for a long, long time, as it should, because when they celebrated it, it went on for eight days. So it goes on for several chapters across uh, the Gospel until you get to 10.22. And in 10.22, you will find, at that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. All the way back to chapter 5 again, and you'll see the very first verse of chapter 5 says, And after this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This 5-1 is not only an introduction to chapter 5. It's an introduction to the whole section of the Gospel that runs from 5.1 through to 10.42. The chronological background for the whole of this section of the Gospel are the festivals of the Jews. Sabbath, Passover, Tabernacles and Dedication. Why would so much of the Gospel be given to this background? Well, obviously, the Gospel's frontline concern, which is the presentation of the person of Jesus as the one who makes God known, is always there. But there are other issues driving this part of the Gospel. And one of them is pastoral. Because if we accept, as we must, that the Jewish community has expelled the Johannine community from its midst, they are now in a situation, wherever they may be in their journey, of no longer being able to celebrate their feasts with their former Jewish friends. Now, to be expelled from the synagogue because you believed that Jesus was the Christ was more than deciding that you didn't like Bishop David's Mass, so you went to the parish next door. To be expelled in a small community in Asia Minor or wherever it might have been meant that you had to go somewhere else to buy your bread. 
you had to go somewhere else to buy your meat. You had to find a completely new social circle who hadn't ostracized you for your day-to-day -day life. You couldn't marry your sons and daughters to whom you would like to marry them because there are age-old rules about who Jews can and cannot marry. So this being sent away from the synagogue makes a huge impact on their life. But most of all, most of all, the question arises in their mind, what about the God of Israel? Have we lost contact with the God of Israel? Because it was in the celebration of the Jewish feasts that the Jewish family, community, and the Jewish individual had this contact with the God of Israel. It's important to be aware that a Jewish feast isn't just a memory of something that took place a long time ago. I'm still rubbing out here. A Jewish feast is called a zikaron. Well, that's the plural. It comes from the Jewish, from the, from the Hebrew word, Hebrew verb, which means to remember. Zechariah, Zechariah means the Lord remembers me. Zechariah, the Lord remembers me. So, Zikaron is the noun that comes from the verb zakah to remember. The feasts are called zikaron because this memory is not having a party to remember that great day a thousand years ago when the God of Israel definitively freed this people from their Egyptian slavery and led them through the Reed Sea, eventually through the, exit, through the deserts until they come back to take, come to take possession of the Promised Land, which would be the celebration of Passover and other associated feasts. It's not a memory of something that happened once upon a time. It is a memory that renders the God of the Passover present. When the Jews celebrate the Passover, and some of you may have had the experience of doing that with them, they tell the story. The youngest person at the table asks, why do we call this night great? and the father of the family or the grandfather will respond by telling what we call the Passover Haggadah. It's the tale, the tale of the events of the Passover. But each Passover Haggadah, even though it has a certain core story which comes from the Bible, it's shot through with references to the current situation of that society, that family, individuals in the family, the God of the Passover, the God of the Exodus, the God who freed these people is not a God who was with them back there to be remembered with a meal, but a God who was with them at that table. Similarly with the other feasts, when the Jews celebrate Sabbath, they recall God as creator and judge. God as creator and judge. When the Jews celebrate tents or um, various names for it, tabernacles it's often called, feast of tab dwellings it's also called, goes back to this word that uh, 
Mary's been pointing out several times, skene, because they dwelt in tents in the Exodus, this dwelling time. They are celebrating not just the fact that during the Exodus God protected them, God led them by fire, God gave them water in the desert, God fed them with manna back then, but the fact that that God is with them in this celebration now. So a zikaron is a ritual celebration that renders the God of the Sabbath, the Passover, tabernacles and dedication present in the celebration. You with me? It's not just a memory of time past. It's a rendering present of that particular action of the God of Israel for his people then and now and over the centuries in between. You might be interested to know that the Greek word is anamnesis. And when we say mass, we have the words of Jesus saying, do this ace ten anamnes in hemin. Do this in memory of me. This, with all due respect to theologians, this is the fundamental background to our understanding of a real presence. A real presence is not the substance and accidents, etc., as we've debated over the years. It is that in our theological debate. But a real presence is that when we celebrate Eucharist, we recall the death and the resurrection of Jesus in a way that is present in that celebration, exactly the same way as the Jews celebrated the memories of the God of the Sabbath, the Passover, the tabernacles, and the dedication. That's the way the sacrifice of Jesus is present to us. Very powerful concept, and we do. That's what anamnesis means. Do this in memory of me. Do this as a zikaron of my death and resurrection, now present among you, dying for you, rising for you, saving you at this table. That's the real presence. And other things as well that the theologians have discussed over the years. But that's what we've got to remember. Okay, from that background, we've got a community, a little Christian community, that's been told, we don't want you when we celebrate. We don't want you when we celebrate the God of the Exodus. We don't want you when we celebrate our, our Sabbath. We don't want you when we celebrate tabernacles. We don't want you when we celebrate dedication. Out of here. So this little community, as I said earlier today, has to face this reality when it's trying to work out its post-Jewish identity. It remains Jewish, but it's got to work out how it continues in some way its association with the God of Israel remembered in that special way in the Feasts of Israel. Now this is what this whole section of the Gospel of John has as its background. Eh? Not saying it exhausts the total reality of this passage, just as when I did the Cana to Cana section. I didn't exhaust the total of reality of what's possible in that section as Mary showed you with a detailed analysis of a couple of chapters. Once you get into the depth, well then all sorts of other richness comes out. And you can do the same here. And I think you're going to look at John 6, aren't you, Mary, at some stage? Okay. So, what we find then, coming back to the Gospel text, is a presentation of the feasts as they would occur in any one year. With the exception, of course, of Sabbath, which happens every week. Sabbath is the foundational feast. It is the feast of God, Creator and Judge. 
and it happens, it begins every Friday night and goes on through till Saturday night. That's the foundational feast. The next feast, which covers John 6, is the celebration of Passover, which takes place in the spring. The next feast, which runs from chapter 7 through to halfway through chapter 10, is Tabernacles, which takes place in the late autumn. And the next feast, Dedication, is a feast that tries to imitate Pentecost, but it takes place in the middle of winter. So we have spring, autumn, winter. And dominating them all, of course, is Sabbath because that happens every week. Now I say that and I don't want you to be too caught up in this because there seems to be an odd aligning of the chapters across 5 and 6 and 7. People think that 6 should come first because Jesus is in Galilee and then away from Galilee and then back in Galilee and so people have suggested over the years even such good Catholic scholars of Rudolf Schnackenburg and Raymond Brown would accept that these chapters should be changed around. I think that is totally wrong because I think they've missed the point that John is not determined by geography but he's determined by this cycle of feasts. That's what determining is determined what happens. So leave 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 exactly where they are. Don't mess them up at all. That's the conservative streak coming out in me. What goes on in these chapters? And I can only briefly show you what goes on. But the overall thing that Jesus does or that John does through Jesus in these chapters <coughs> is that he takes the ritual, the symbols, the biblical text used and the theology of the Jewish memory and applies them to Jesus. In other words, as I've said earlier in Mary, Mary repeated again when Mary talked about a gift in place of a gift. What they have through their mosaic tradition has not been lost, but they now have it perfected in another gift, and that is the gift of Jesus Christ. So, it is very important for the fourth evangelist, for John, to argue that they have not lost the God of Sabbath that they have not lost the God of Passover, that they have not lost the God of Tabernacles or the God of Dedication, but all that was associated with the memory of that particular aspect of Jewish religious thought and practice is now part and parcel of their belief in Jesus Christ. What has happened is that which is Jewish has been rendered totally Christological. What was once applied of God is now applied to Jesus. Now, often people talk about John's Gospel as a replacement. John's Gospel is sort of replacing Judaism. I don't think that's what John's trying to do. John's trying to show that what you once had, and I have a book with this title, is, was, a sign and a shadow of a full reality that you now have in the person of Jesus. Now this is very difficult for a contemporary Jew or a Jew even of that time to accept but it is the Christian view. The important point I want to make is it doesn't denigrate the Jewish celebration. The Jewish celebration remains in place its theology remains in place. Its symbolism remains in place. The only difference is that it's no longer applied to the God of Israel. It's now applied to God's Son in Israel, Jesus Christ. It's rendered historical. It's rendered personal. So this is a, to use more technical language, this section is a Christological reading of the great festive tradition of Israel. For pastoral reasons, don't forget that. 
to assure this little community they haven't lost the God of Israel. They haven't lost the God of Sabbath, Pentecost, oh, that, that's an earlier feast, it's also true there as well. They haven't lost the feast of, of Sabbath, Passover, tabernacles and dedication. Still there. But in rituals and in a theology that circulate around the person of Jesus. Let me show how that works in practice as quickly as I can. The first feast that we deal with is Sabbath. And Jesus works a miracle, chapter 5, on the Sabbath. This leads to a conflict because he has broken the Sabbath by telling the man to take up his bed and walk. Eventually this leads to the man identifying Jesus as the one who gave him the order. The crucial verses, as Mary has already mentioned, are found in verses 17 and 18. Or even go back to verse 16. After the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well, therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on a Sabbath. So they started to persecute Jesus, the text says. The actual verb, dioko, can also mean judge Jesus. They began to judge Jesus or to put Jesus to a judgment. Now that's important because the rest of the chapter is about a court scene. That's why the Jews began to set up, set a judgment upon Jesus because he broke the Sabbath. And the charges are first Jesus answers the allegation by using the passage that Mary said my father is still working and I am working. According to Jewish theology based on Genesis 1 no, sorry, beginning of Genesis 2 God rested on the Sabbath so the whole Jewish practice of Sabbath practice and Sabbath rest comes from the fact that God rests on the Sabbath however this led to practical and theological difficulties because if God was resting on a Sabbath who was responsible for the life of newborn children who were born on a Sabbath? <laughs> and who was responsible for judging the people who died on a Sabbath? So it's always, it's always real life that creates difficulties, isn't it? It's all very well to say God rested on a Sabbath. But the history of the world goes on, and if God stops, everything stops. Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> Sounds like when I was in Washington. You said something true, and you get 20 people say, Amen, Father. <laughs> the first time they did it, I thought I'd said something wrong. <laughs> and then I realized they were complimenting me. Okay. So, Jewish theologians, rightly, came to the conclusion, look, we have to let God work on a Sabbath. <laughs> but we'll only let him do two things. <laughs> on a Sabbath, God and God alone gives life and judges. And so this is a part of the Sabbath God. God alone gives life and judges. But only God works. Only God gives life and, 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 and judges. But look what Jesus says. My father is working. Well, they're prepared to accept that God works, but they're not too happy with Jesus calling him my father. And even worse when he says, and I am working too. My father is still working. They're prepared to accept that God works on the Sabbath. But he then claims that he is also working. 
and then you get the accusations for the trial that will follow. For this reason, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because, one, he was not only breaking the Sabbath, that's the miracle, he was calling God his Father, second mortal sin, thereby making himself equal to God, third mortal sin. If he can claim to be working on a Sabbath, he's doing what only God can do. Therefore, he's making himself equal to God. Now notice, it is his opponents that say he was equal to God because Jesus refuses that. He then begins, we then begin a long court case that has two stages. The first stage runs from verse 19 to verse 30 verse 29, sorry 30, in which he says, the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. He depends upon the father, but in a very special way. Now look back at verse 30, on at verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Jesus does not claim to be equal to God, but to be sent by God to do in history the life-giving and judging that God does. In the first discourse, and we can't go through it in detail, I just want you to run your eye down. Verses 19 to 30. Look what Jesus says in verse 21. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wishes. Life giver, okay? The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, verse 22. So, judge. Verse 23 is crucial to the whole discourse. So that all may honour the Son. They want to kill him. Just as they honour the Father. Anyone who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Jesus is sent by the Father to repeat in history the life-giving and judging role of the Father. This is the Sabbath role of God being taken over by Jesus himself. And the same thing is in the second half of the discourse. And he actually says it's very beautiful. For, verse 26. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment. See this judgment, life, judgment, life, all the way through it. These are the Sabbath authorities that have been passed from the Father to the Son. And if you really say you're going to honour the Father, well, I'm sorry, boys and girls, but you're going to have to honour the Son too. And the Son is now your life giver and judge. The Son is now, because he's been given this authority by God among you, is now the memory of Sabbath living among you. In the second part of the discourse, starting from verse 31, we find that Jesus brings witnesses. The first part of the court case is Jesus presents his case as being the sent one of, the, of God and as such the life giver and the judge. Then the case goes on, if I testify to myself my testimony is not true. So he draws out a whole lot of witnesses as anyone would in a court case. And what's really ironic, we'll go right to the end, in the end he says to them, do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Not me, I won't do it. Your accuser is Moses, upon whom you have set your hope. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Why is that ironic? Because this whole trial began on the basis of the law of Moses. They attack him on the Mosaic law about obeying Sabbath. And in the end, he says, after he draws all his witnesses, 
You know who's going to condemn you to the Father? The very bloke you called is my condemner. So the Moses thing begins with the Sabbath law and it ends by saying, Moses wrote about me. You can't understand it. He will accuse you to my Father who has given me Sabbath authority. So this is Jesus taking over the Sabbath authority. Chapter 6 is about Passover. We can't spend as much time as we would like on these and Mary's going to deal with this in detail. Let me just say two simple things about chapter 6. The first thing to remember, I'm not sure how Mary will take this, but very important in my mind is once the wandering Israel crosses the Jordan and comes into the Holy Land, the manna stops and they have to produce their life from the land that's been given to them. But the manna in the form of the bread from heaven stops. But Jewish, Jewish writers, thinkers, religious thought continues to talk about the bread from heaven. But the bread from heaven now is Torah. It's the law. The law which has been given to us from it. That is our bread from heaven. We no longer need the nourishing bread from heaven that we received in the desert. We now have bread that we make ourselves, but our bread from heaven is Torah. And across the whole of John 6, not the whole of it, but the bulk of John 6, as John talks to, his, to the crowd, he talks to them about the bread that Moses gave you, which has now been perfected by a, a bread that will give you eternal life. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert. They're dead. The bread that I will give you will give you eternal life. Great, say the Jews. We'll have some of that. And they say, I am the bread from heaven. Here we see Jesus replacing, to use that word, perfecting the gift of Torah. And all the way through the discourse until you get to verse 49, 50, 51, Jesus isn't talking about Eucharist. He's talking about believe in me if you want to have life. Believe in what I've got to tell you because the Son is making the Father known. Because the Jewish tradition is Torah makes the Father known. Jesus is saying, I am the true bread from heaven. I am making the Father known. Now, in any Christian community, if you are talking about bread from heaven that makes God known, you're automatically going to finish up where? Eucharist. Eucharist. And so the end of the discourse flows automatically into Eucharist. From verses 51 to 58, this more, more Torah-centered presentation of Jesus as the bread from heaven that makes God known is then rendered Eucharistic by talking about eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man. And whoever eats this bread, it becomes Eucharistic. And to my mind, this is a very important uh, pastoral matter as well. It's all very well to talk about the bread from heaven, from the Torah, I believe in Jesus. Where is he? And so John says, in the body broken and the spilt blood of your Eucharistic celebration. That's where you make your decision for this new bread from heaven. That's where you meet the revelation of God in and through Jesus. The cross becomes central. So Jesus takes over the whole Passover mystique of a, of a God who nourishes his people as they wander through the wilderness. He sets them free and so the Passover God is perfected in Jesus in John 6. In chapters 7, 8, 9 and 10 we celebrate the great feast of the tabernacles. This is a feast how am I going for time? What time do I finish here? Seven minutes. Ooh, a lot to do in seven minutes. This is a feast that has a number of very important elements to it. It's the longest feast of the year. It goes for eight days. It is associated with a lot of symbols. It was initially a pre-Israelite day before there was an Israel. It was a harvest feast. 
This is when they made whoopee. There were a lot of children conceived during this feast. They all went out into the fields, they drank the new wine, they, they, they asked for rain from the gods. This was a great celebration, and it was in Israel too. But this great joyful celebration was applied to the experience of the wandering Israel, the protecting God looking after a wandering Israel in their tents. But the autumn, late autumn, pleas for rain from the pagan feasts, feast of light, all of these things remain. And so you find that this feast is dominated by the celebration of water, as is normal at a late autumn celebration when the harvests have just been cut down and they need water light which within once once Israel has attached this feast to its exodus experience this is the pillar of fire leading them through the desert Messiah this is a time when there was a heightened messianic expectation while they're all having a ball and getting excited about God's love and care for them they said now he'll send us the Messiah this is the feast, and we have this from Josephus, when the Romans made sure that the Antonia fortress was well stocked with soldiers. This is when somebody would start doing something silly and start a revolt because the Messiah is coming. So it's a great messianic period. And the final thing is it's a feast of the one true God. The water was celebrated by a procession down to the pool of Siloam, the only living water in the whole of Jerusalem to this day. All the other water you get in Jerusalem comes from cisterns and from rain, etc. But to this day, there is a spring of water gurgling up at the pool of Siloam. And there's a procession to, down to the water and they gather this water and they have a great celebratory march up the hill and all singing songs and waving what we call the, the they had big palms and they'd wave them around and sing songs and dance etc until they came up and they poured the water over the altar and they anointed the altar that's the water the light they constituted five big menorah in the middle of the of the court of the temple and the Mishnah, the, the Jewish document from the 3rd century, remembers and says, the temple became the light of every courtyard in Jerusalem. The temple becomes the light of the whole of Jerusalem. Messiah, as I said, there's a great messianic expectation. One true God. Each morning, the priests walked across to the wall and look towards where the sun would rise. And if you've ever been in Israel and you see the sun rise and go down, it's amazing. You see nothing and then all of a sudden it almost jumps up. And it does the same when it goes down. So they would wait expectantly for the sun to just begin to come up and they would say across to the sun, looking back to a reference from the prophet Ezekiel, our fathers worshipped you. And they would turn back to the Holy of Holies and they say but we worship the one true God. These are the four major elements in the Jewish celebration of the feast. Across 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 we have the bitterest nastiest encounters between Jesus and the Jews particularly in 7 and 8. 9 and 10 not so bad. But across these chapters Jesus talks about he is the living water. He is the one. If you look at 737 to 38. On the last day of the festival, the great day when Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. How one interprets that is greatly debated, but I'm seeing this as the Christological source of living water. No longer the pool of Siloam, 
but Jesus is the source of living water. You'll have to believe me when I tell you in 8.12 and in 9.5 Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The whole of this, particularly 7 and 8, and then into 10 where he reveals himself as the Good Shepherd, the messianic questions up there all the time. Is this the Messiah? How can this be the Messiah? And finally, this clash between Israel who will not accept that Jesus is the sent one of God. They claim to be the believers in the one true God. And Jesus says to them, this big argument about who's father. They claim that Jesus is born in illegitimacy. He tells them in a nice friendly way that they are children of the devil. So nice conversation going on here. It's all about paternity. And Jesus claims that the God of Israel is his father. And they reject that claim. So each morning they go out for their celebration and swear that they are committed to the one true God and his son is in the midst and they are rejecting him. And they are making a lie out of their morning prayer. So there's seven and we'll look at nine in detail tomorrow and I'll show you the light and the water working together there. Chapter 10 is Feast of Dedication and I'll need to finish with this but in 10 Dedication is a very recent feast, very recent. Started about 165 BC when the temple was restored after the destruction of the Maccabean Wars, the, the occupation of Israel by the people from Syria. They've no longer got a temple. So they decide that they clear away the, 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 the consecrated stones of the, of the temple that's been desecrated and put new stones in and they now got a temple. This is all goes back to the times of Judas Maccabeus about 165 BC. So at last they've got a consecrated temple. But as Mary's explained so well to you this morning, it's Mary's very special interest, this temple is not a pile of stones on the hill. For Jews this isn't a pile of stones on the hill. This is the living presence of the God among their people. And when there's no longer temple, they remember it as the Shekinah of God, the glory of God. They, they say that there was always a cloud hanging over this temple. If the Jews wanted to know, does God dwell in your midst, they would look to the temple and they say, of course he does. There he is in those stones up there. But in John, in the Feast of the Dedication, Jesus says, the Father has consecrated me and sent me to you. And he says, the Father and I are one. I am in the Father and the Father is me. You don't need a pile of stones on the hill. You've got me. And so in this way, Sabbath, creation, judgment, giving life. Passover, bread from heaven. Tabernacles, water, light, Messiah, the one true God temple at the dedication, it all becomes the person of Jesus Christ alive in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.